Alright, what up y'all? This is Scotty D from Fagolovers.net and I've got the one and only Jump Steady on the phone with me. What's up, Jump Steady? Hey, what's up, Scotty? How's it going? Oh, uh, doing doing great over here, man. I've got <laughs> quite a few questions for you, uh mostly user submitted, but some some uh, of my own. So uh let's get this thing rolling. Alright, uh last year you were involved in, in gathering planning. Uh you, you kinda got involved in it in, in it again. Uh, but this year it was like your baby from the beginning. How have things changed since you started planning from the first gathering in 2000? Well, it's it's very similar to the the very first gathering I did because in the uh, in the original gatherings that I, that I used to put on way back in the day, it was pretty much I did like most of the work, and then uh, like Billy, he did all the production, like as far as staging and lights and everything. He handled all that aspect of it, and I pretty much did everything else. And uh, this gathering. It's very similar to that. Like, you know, we all, like, come up with the ideas for the gathering, and we, like, you know, we we, uh, we put out questions to the jugglers and stuff online. You know, we reach out to the family, and we basically ask them for their opinions on stuff, like what artists they want to see or what events they would like to see, and we take all that in consideration, and then we, uh, you know, we compile all that information, and we, we start to piece together what the gathering is going to be that, for that year. Now, last year... I only had probably about like 20% to do with the gathering. Uh, I was pretty much just focusing on events, like, uh, you know, everything from the <clears throat> Miss Juggalette pageant to the uh, Ned game and stuff like that. I was kind of mostly dealing with that. And also I was dealing with uh, booking the underground artists. But this year uh, I'm basically taking on most of the responsibility of the gathering. Like I, I would say about 90% of it. <laughs> it's like, you know, and and from booking all the major acts and everything else, like like last year because you know I don't know how many people know this, but I was like I was gone from psychopathic for a while, so when I came back in, there was kind of other people that kind of took the gathering under uh, under their wing, so I had to kind of take a back seat to that and kind of just look at what they were doing, put my two cents in here or there, but I didn't really like what they were doing. You know what I mean? Not like I had a lot of problems with it. It was it was it made me very uncomfortable just to sit back. You know, and uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, the people that, were, that at the time were working on the gathering, they would come at me and they would be like, okay, yeah, we reached out to this guy, we reached out to that guy, we weren't able to get him. You know, and, and in the back of my head, my, my, you know, my question was always like, well, if they said no, I mean, did you just give up at that point? <laughs> you know, did, did you keep at it? You know, like, I'm, I'm very persistent. Uh, I'm a very persistent ninja, so, like, you know, for me, like, a lot of the artists we got this year, you know, they said no at first, you know. It, it was just like, no, I can't make it, da da, da. So I, I just kept at it, you know. I didn't give up. I didn't say, no, okay, straight. And I think that um, the lineup we got this year is, is, is straight up devastating. Like, it's it's one of my favorite lineups for me personally. You know, as somebody that uh, is a true, like, hip-hop head, it's like, you know, it, it, to me it's like, it, it's, the, it's the best of the underground music that's out there. You know what I mean? Like all the major underground labels, the, the, what I consider major underground labels, they're all like crazy highly represented this year, mm -hmm. which is something I haven't had in you know in a very long time, if ever. You know, so um, and then and then also like you know just bringing in like Cypress Hill and stuff like that. Like we've been trying to get Cypress Hill since the inception of the of the gathering. You know what I mean? So it's like you know the fact that we finally you know we're able to get them this year is like a, a super it's a super honor, you know what I mean, to have them, and it's a super privilege to have them at the gathering this year. So, um, so yeah, I just feel that, uh, you know, I kind of threw myself into it, um, especially because the last gathering, uh, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of hurting last year. That we had a lot of problems last year that, that basically, um, you know, brought brought a lot of financial problems to us and everything. So I was like really determined this year to make sure everything was on point. You know, like last year, the tickets were mailed out late. You know, people showed up at the gate. There's, there's no programs or metal ambulance. They, like, ran out because they didn't, you know, they didn't have them there and stuff. Like, you know, I just, and, and plus all, you know, the, the problems of people getting through the gate, like, it was, like, really slow and stuff. Like, it, 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 it took a really long time for people to even get into the ground. So, I, like, I was watching all this, you know, like last year. And, and uh, basically, I was really determined not to see those same mistakes happen again. Well, wow, that's... Know? So it, that's comforting yeah. to know because uh, because I, it it was a kind of a clusterfuck last year, but uh, 
but yeah, you, you've told me. So, um, go ahead. Yeah. So the one thing about last year's gathering too was, you know, like 2013 was a really hard year for us, you know, and I think that 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 a lot of the problems that we had was just like, you know. It was kind of like, you know, with Twisted leaving and, and other bad things happening all at the same time. It was just kind of like, it was it was almost like a downer, you know? So uh, and I think that affected uh, how many people came that year, you know? And then another big problem was the fact that, you know, being our seventh year at the same place, like, ninjas knew the, the ground, like, you know, and there was a lot of people just sneaking in, you know? We had, we had a lot of jugglers just sneaking in. You know, I, I probably got approached about, I don't know, 40, 50 times, you know. Like, you know, Juggalo's coming up to me and like, oh, man, I lost my wristband in the mosh pit. Like, everybody had the same story. <laughs> <laughs> they all lost in the mosh pit. You know, I'm like, damn, I was about to hell in a mosh pit. <laughs> like, damn. You know, but like, you know, and they were sneaking in. I, You know, not saying they're all, you know, lying. Maybe some did, you know, but you pretty much knew. Like, you know, everybody's walking around with no wristbands on. And, you know, and... and Believe me, like I've snuck into my fair share of events throughout the years, you know. Mm. So I'm not eating on people sneaking in, but it was just to the point where it was hurting us, like to to the point where it was jeopardizing even having a gathering again. You know what I mean? So it, it really, uh, it really made us have to, you know, look at the whole situation. Like, you know, I evaluated everything, and it was like, okay, one, we can't go back there. Like, you know, like if we go back there again, you know, financially it would just ruin us. You know what I mean? So it was like, all right, and plus, you know, you could just tell that people are waiting for, you know, you know, jugglers are waiting for something different. You know what I mean? Like, it, it had been there for so long, and it was a cool spot, don't get me wrong, and there was a lot of love there from the people that own the grounds and everything, but it was just ready for that change, you know? It was time to, like, you know, we need, we need to take Ant this up. But, you know, I wanted to mention, too, I'm sorry if I'm rambling a little no, bit. But, you know, no, this is great information, man. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to mention too that I really loved last year's gathering though. Like when we were walking, like like when I was walking around, like because I was kind of overseeing all the events, you know, making sure they were being ran right and stuff. And uh, it just seemed like everybody was having a, a a really good time last year. And I don't know, like you know, people, you know, ninjas here in this interview. I don't know if you, y'all are feeling the same, but like to me, it was like the jugglers that showed up that year, they were like super down, you know what I mean, like, they were like the, they were like, they were like the truth, like, each one of them carried the true spirit of the juggalo, you know what I mean, it was like, it was kind of like, you know, everybody was kind of feeling sour about Twisted Leaving and stuff, a lot of people, like, oh, you know, there was like, even people hating on us and stuff, but it was like, the people that were there, they were true jugglos through and through, you know, and there was mad love there, it was kind of like, the cream of the crop situation. So everywhere I went, it was just nothing but love. You know what I mean? And it was just like ninjas having a super good time. So my actual gathering experience, even though financially it was crazy crippling, uh, you know, my experience of the gathering last year was awesome. Like I left there uplifted, you know, spiritually. I was like, man, that was great. But the thing is, is that, uh, you know, this year we're not having anywhere near those problems. Like this year right now, the pre-sales are double what they were last year. You know, this year right now, it just seems like it's pop. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to sit back. I'm not going to sit back and take all the credit for it. I mean, we have a really good team. You know, some of those people that were working the gathering last year, they're gone now. Basically, all of them were. And uh, you know, the team we got this year, I kind of like, I, I hand picked some of them. You know what I mean? Like, I really pushed for them to, to get hired here. Was uh, the team we got this year is awesome. Like you know what I mean? We got we got we got a solid team that's putting on this gathering, and um, you know, and and people are like working super hard, you know, to make sure that this is the best gathering ever, and it's reflected in everything. Like I feel like, like if you look at, I don't know if you all remember the last, even the website last year was horrible. <laughs> it was hard to navigate. It just looked shitty. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, every aspect of the gathering this year, I feel like there's heart put into it. There's just super heart put into it. And I think that's, uh, I think that's evident, like, in, in every aspect of it. It's just, uh, it's just like, it, it, you know, I feel like the magic is building. You know, it's, it's like there, you know, and it's like, and it's resonating out there. And, and people are, you know, 
mad hype on this, you know. All juggalos are just, like, really ready for this, and I think it's going to be a really good year overall, you know. Yeah, and I, and I think with the the change of scenery and, and like you said, a, lo- a lot of a lot of juggalos that I've seen online are, are just super hype, even veterans, you know, that, that have been to all of them, you know, myself included. This just seems like it's going to be just unforgettable, so... So, yeah, you know, one of the things that really helped it out was, you know, when, when that whole thing went down with Kaiser, Missouri, mm-hmm. you know, and it, believe me, that was like a low point in my life, <laughs> you know, a real low point, you know, because I found the spot and everything, so I felt like, uh, I felt really responsible for it. Um, you know, you know, we were sitting around having a meeting about it, and, and I was like, you know who we need to find? We need to find somebody that's down for our cause, that ha- actually has our back. It's like, you know, there, there's ninjas out there that are like, man, that's bullshit, what's going on with the FBI, you know what I mean? Like, they have Juggalos' backs, even if they don't know anything about Juggalos. They're just like, man, that's bullshit, how those people are being oppressed, you know? And we needed to find somebody like that, and that's who we found at Legend Valley was uh, Steve Trickle. You know, he was like, my first conversation with him, he was just basically telling me that. <laughs> he was like, I think it's bullshit what you guys are going through. I've been to the gatherings before. I know what they are. I know they're nowhere near as hyped up or as wild, you know, violent and all this stuff as they're claiming to be in the papers. And he was like, I know what Juggalos are about. And he was just so showing super, like, respect. And, like, you know, he was like, man, I have y'all's back. I think that's bullshit. What's going on with the FBI? And it was like, man, this is, like, the perfect situation. It, in fact, it was so perfect, it was almost like, man, it might have been a blessing losing Kaiser, Missouri. You know what I mean? Like, it, it might have been. And I know people, you know, ninjas over there that live close to there, they're not thinking that, but I think overall it might have been a blessing. <laughs> you know? It ended up being a, a super benefit having to move like that. So, um, and, and then the grounds itself is awesome. You know, it's it's just going to look amazing. You know, and the, and the setup we have, like where, every, where where all the stages are at and everything, it's just, I think it's just going to be, a, uh, you know, it's going to be epic. Yeah, I'm super hype about it, man. Obviously, we have to wait to, to find out how everything goes this year, but do you see Legend Valley being a, a, a long-term uh, gathering gathering spot? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh I feel like the gathering should never be at the same place for longer than three years. Like, I I think in any scenario, three years is about max. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. like, uh, I would like to see, like, basically my plan is after the gathering to get the feedback from the family. You know what I mean? Like, what do you all think? You know, and just kind of, like, get the feedback if people were feeling it or, you know what I mean? If if, if jugglers are mad hype on it, then, yeah, you know, we'll come back. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll, We'll do it again at the same place, but... That's just my thought. Like, it should never be, like, I remember uh, way back in the day, Juggalos used to say, man, the thing I love about the gathering, it moves every year, you know? So it's not just, it, it's like that added benefit. It's like, you know, you get to go and, and hang out with your family, you know, the greatest the greatest family reunion in the world. But, you know, we also get to see this new place, you know, that we've never been to, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and, and, and for a lot of jugglers, they're like, man, I never go nowhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? I never, you know, the gathering is my one time where I travel every year. And it's like, you know, and it's almost like ninjas, uh, you know, love that element of it. Because they go out and explore the city and, you know, get to see a new place or whatever. And, and I, I feel that. But, you know, it's hard taking it to a new place every year, especially with everything that's going on with the, you know, the FBI label us, the gang and everything. It's incredibly hard trying to find a place. And then once you do, to, like, keep that place, you know, and then even dealing with businesses, like, you know, the, you know, different businesses you have to hire and put on the gathering every year. You know, everything from the, the staging to the lights, the generators, the porta potties the portable shower units, you know. Like, you know, you have no idea, like, how many outside, you know, uh, people we have to bring in to, to create this town, you know, mm-hmm. for that weekend, you know. And uh, it, it's... Uh, it's, it's been very difficult. Like, you know, it's it's not easy. It's not, it's it's a lot of uh, jumping hurdles and climbing over walls to make stuff happen and getting doors slammed in your face, you know, especially for those that don't understand what it really is. You know, they just, they fear, uh, they fear us. <laughs> they fear us coming into their town and they hear all these stories and they just think it's this horrible, horrible thing, you know, and it's like, you know, unless you're a part of it or been to it, 
you know, you can't really understand it, you know what I mean, for what it is. And it's, uh, the gathering is one of the most beautiful things on, on this planet, in Absolutely. my opinion. Like, I, you know, fucking, I love being at the gathering and, you know, just being with the family and just, uh, you know, floating around the grounds at night and talking to ninjas. <laughs> it's just like, it's just an awesome time, man. So, um, but yeah, so to answer your question, I could see coming back again, but it's up, it's up to the family, you know what I mean? It's up to y'all, like, you know, if it's like, like we're going to reach out to everybody and see what everybody's thinking, you know what I mean? And, and if everybody's feeling it, yeah, we'll come back again. Cool, cool. You know, okay. But I, I want to come back for more than three years in a row to any place, no matter how dope it was. That's just my personal opinion. Right, I hear you. All right, so yeah. so with with the change of location and everything, there seems to be a lot more first time gathering goers. What what what's the best piece of advice you can give to somebody going for the first time? Well, you know, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, uh, yeah, as far as like giving advice to people that are, that are going for the first time, like, are you talking about like non juggalos, like just trying to come? No, in no, there? no, not at all. No juggalos that just have never been to a gathering before. I don't know, you know, exactly what kind of advice I could give. I mean, be prepared. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, the main thing is, uh, you know, bring plenty of food if you're camping. Bring plenty of food and water and supplies. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the one thing that hurts a lot of ninjas every year. They don't come prepared. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, ninjas are floating around there, like, you know, hungry and stuff. And, you know, we... We got organizations that are set up, like, you know, the FCU and stuff like that to kind of help out in those situations. But, like, you know, it, it, you just got to be prepared. You know what I mean? Look at it like uh, if you're camping, look at it like, you know, almost like a military situation, okay? I'm going to be here for, like, X amount of days living in the field. So, you know, let me bring some of this food. And you can go shopping and get some cheap-ass food, you know, some canned food to last you for the weekend. You know, it's not even that expensive. So I, I would just say to be prepared, you know. Um, you know what I mean? Sunscreen is not a bad idea if you plan on like being out in the sun for any any amount of time and, and just be ready for it. But you know, if this is your first time coming, I feel like it's a great year. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a good representation uh, of what the gathering needs to be every year. You know what I mean? If this is your first time coming. That's awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I, I don't I don't see how you could be disappointed. You know what I mean? It's like you know you got this incredible lineup, but you know, everybody knows, you know, the main thing is, is just being with family for those four days, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's, it's almost like fuck the outside world, you know, for those four days. It's like, you know, you go through your whole life and, and people are kind of downing you and stuff like that and, like, you know what I mean, for being a juggler or whatever, or like judging you or whatever, and here here's a spot you can come and, you know, you don't have to deal with any of that bullshit, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I was talking to Jason about it, you know, Jay Webb and, um, he was saying, like, you know, he said something really interesting to me, you know, that I never really even thought about, but he was saying, like, juggalos are the last great subculture in America, you know? It's something that, like, you know, there used to be, like, like you used to have, like, punk rockers and, you know, the emo kids and stuff like that, you know? But the, those have all been, like, commercialized, you know what I mean? Like, they found a way to market that, and now you see them everywhere. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're just, like, and, and juggalos are, like, there's there's like a group that they um they can't figure out a way to like one they don't understand and they can't figure out a way to market it you know what I mean or to you know to, to commercialize it or whatever you know what I mean because like juggalos aren't about that so it's like it's like this group that they they don't understand and they can't exploit you know what I mean so like you know and and, and because of that they like they naturally gravitate toward not liking juggalos you know what I mean and. And that kind of like fuels out into uh, normal society, and you got like people hating on juggalos, and they don't even know why. They don't even, they don't even like, they don't even know what a juggalo is, or never even like, you know, uh, had a conversation with them. But they're hating on them, and they don't realize that they're the fucking whack ones. You know what I mean? Absolutely. They're the fucking sheep. They're the ones that are all commercialized and and just you know feeding the bullshit, you know, getting fed the bullshit that. Uh, that mainstream corporate America wants wants you to, to, to buy into. You know what I mean? They're the ones that are that are like the zombies. You know what I mean? And, and they're just sitting back like hating on jug rolls. You know what I mean? Because they don't understand and they, they, they fear the jug rolls. Anyway, Jay Webb could explain it a lot better than me, but like when he was, when I was talking, I was like, man, you're fucking right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all these people sitting back 
and, and you know, if you have a problem with the juggalo, you know, you have a problem with juggalos and stuff, you're the fucking whack one, you know what I mean? You're the fucking one that's just brainwashed in the, into just accepting whatever mainstream wants you to accept, you know what I mean? Like, and, and so anything different is to be feared, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you don't accept this this other group, you know, because they don't conform to society. They don't conform to corporate America, you know what I mean? We can't exploit this group. We don't understand this group, you know. We can't we can't tap into this group, therefore hate it, you know what I mean? And, uh, and you know, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, you know. It's just, it just makes sense to me anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so you you mentioned the the scrub care unit. How did they get brought to your attention originally, and and like what made you want to reach out to them to be a part of the gathering? Well, you know, last year, um, well, actually, uh, the the main guy he uh, he contacted me, and he was basically telling me that uh, uh, you know what he was about. He sent this like email in, and I heard about what they were doing, uh, you know, from the year before, and you know. So their, their whole hook is like to, to give out food and clothing and stuff, you know, to, to juggle as a need. And, and so, like, to me, it was like, man, that's kind of dope. <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, they're kind of like looking out for juggalos, you know, the, they're at the gathering. And there's other organizations, too. There's a, uh, I know there's a religious organization that was there last year. They're going to be there again this year as well, you know, it's in the parking lot and stuff like that. Now, it, it, for us, for us, it's a benefit bone situation, you know, and I, and I had to talk to them about it. And I love what they're doing, but, you know, if they're just, you know, at the same token, if they're just giving out free food like 24-7, you know, it also, it's a double-edged sword because, you know, we want to help and target jugglers that need it. But, you know, at the same time, if he's just like feeding the whole gathering, you know, we're going to lose our ass again. <laughs> right. and it, it's right. going to be the point, it's going to come to the point where we're going to go out of business and we're not going to be able to do it again then the next year, you know, because, like, and I know people said this in interviews and, and, and for some jugglers, they're like, oh, bullshit, but honestly, we hardly ever make any money at the gathering. It's, it's like we strive to break even. Like, if you look at that lineup, it's so devastating, but we're not, we don't have any corporate sponsorship. We don't have Pepsi signs everywhere, you know. We have none. You know what I mean? We don't have to walk around with a Red Bull in our hand, <laughs> you know, and that's the, that's the established drink. We don't get funded by Fago, you know what I mean? None of that, you know. So it's like, it's like we're, you know, it's, as, as a music festival, it's just really unique, you know. It's it's a truly underground event. It's just ran by a small group of ninjas and here up here at Psychopathic Records, putting this fucking shit on every year. You know what I mean? It's like, like we create the foundation for the gathering, but then it, you know the magic is created by everybody. But we we have to put together the foundation, and it, and it's ridiculous money like it's like uh um i mean to give you an idea like all right generators you know generators can cost up to like 50 grand just for that (laughs) you know like you know and and the thing is you know the thing i want to mention the ninjas too coming this year is like you know you know the the thing is like you know sneaking in okay if you're fucking broke Broke, broke, broke. We can't fucking afford it at all. You know what I mean? Okay, that's understandable. But if you all can afford the fucking gathering, like, please don't fucking sneak in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, when you buy that ticket, you're supporting everything. You're supporting, you know, what we got going on so we can keep doing it every year. You know what I mean? But the main thing is the fucking spray paint. Like, y'all gotta fucking cut that shit out, man. You know? <laughs> to me, like, ninjas with spray paint, that's like the, the most biggest disrespect you know what I mean? It's like it's like a big fuck you to us. It's a big fuck you to the juggalos. And it's, and it's definitely a big fuck you to the, the people that own that property that are allowing us into their home. You know what I mean? Can you imagine if you threw a party at, at your house and, and some ninjas were just spray painting up your fucking bedrooms and shit? You know what I mean? Just to do it? Yeah, we like, have you know what I mean? Well, you know how disrespectful that is? You know what I mean? And, and I want to say this, man, like, like, back in the day, that's a that's a big difference from, like, back in the day. Cause I remember back in the day at Nelson Ledges, like, you know, we, we asked the Juggalos, look, man, can y'all refrain from vandalism? And, and Juggalos used to fucking, they used to fucking gather up. You know what I mean? They used to, like, you know, almost militant. If they seen anybody fucking trying to do some shit or whatever, they would, like, you know, they would have, 
our backs, they'd have their backs, you know, and they, they would confront a motherfucker and be like, man, y'all got to fucking stop this shit. You know what I mean? That's some bullshit. I remember um, one year uh, at Nelson Ledges, we used to have the uh, those uh, buses going back and forth from the parking lot to the actual venue, and uh, somebody uh, used magic marker on the bus, and, you know, juggalos were hunting them down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they would have done if they would have found them, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were fucking stupidly hunting them motherfuckers down. Like, we're going to fucking beat these motherfuckers ass for doing this. You know what I mean? And that was just, like, spec, you know? It was like, man, that's that's fucking love right there. That's just mad, mad respect, you know? That, that they would have our backs like that and, like, look out. You know what I mean? Because they know that, like, okay, motherfucker, when you spray paint and shit, you're jeopardizing the whole gathering. You know what I mean? Like, like you know... And last year in particular, like, you know, and it's only a few, you know, there's only a few ninjas that do it. But, like, um, you know, we lost so much money last year, and on top of that, you know, with all the uh, spray paint that was going on, it's just, like, it's really kind of hurt us, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, you know, so that, that's the other thing, man. Just, like, y'all leave the spray paint at home, you know. If y'all got respect and love for what the gathering is, and, and I would like to assume that everybody come and does, you know what I mean? That this is an event they want to see happen every year, you know, and and, uh, and to the other jugglers, you know, to the rest of the family, man, I gotta say, man, please look out. You know what I mean? You see, you see some of that shit going down, like stop it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like you know, to, to me, that's what uh, that's what a family is. That's what the, what the love is. You know, it's like you know, everybody's got each other's back. You know, trying to help out. You know. Sure, definitely. I think it goes without saying that, that that over the past 15 years of the gathering going on, you've always had the, the cards stacked against you guys. This year in particular, though, there seems to be a lot of uh, like bullshit news articles about strip searches and bullshit propaganda. Yeah, what are your thoughts on all on all of those that 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 are that are just obviously trying to hurt you guys? Yeah, some of it like the the whole strip search thing. <laughs> like, I, I just it's just frustrating for me. You know, it's like. You know, it's like everything that we do, you know, we, we, I feel like we're, we're keeping everybody, like, you know, keeping the whole family informed of what's going on. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, every step of the way, like, with what happened in Kaiser, you know, I know I addressed that and I basically wrote a long thing about it. Like, what exactly happened? I broke it down. You know, we kept it real. This is what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's fucked up, you know. But, you know, there's, like, it, almost because that, that gathering got canceled, I feel like there's a little residual fear that's floating around, you know what I mean? And and uh, and when something happens, any kind of bad news, it's like it's like ninjas want to latch onto that, and they want to blow it up. And, you know, they're not even, like, really reading what they're reading, you know what I mean? They're just like, it's almost like that one article about the strip searching and everything. It's like... It's like ninjas aren't even fucking really reading it. It's like they probably read like a quarter of it and they're already tweeting it out. You know what I mean? Like just try to spread the fear, you know? And uh, fear is a motherfucker, man. Like, you know what I mean? You can't let it control you. You definitely can't let it stop you from doing what you want to do. If you let that stop you, man, it's like you're a punk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like, uh, that one article uh, in particular, the one about the strip search, I mean, if you really fucking took the time to read that, you know it's bullshit. It's you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it, it's complete bullshit. And, and one, you know, we would never give out people's personal information. Uh, it's against the law. You know what I mean? <laughs> For one, you know, uh, even giving it to the law, you can't just do that. Like, you know what I mean? And, and even if they requested it, we would never do that, you know? Because um, I think the article in particular was saying that, you know, they got all the information and they're running background checks and they're going to start arresting people uh, at the gate. And two, we don't ask for IDs when people are coming in the gate. You know what I mean? We just take your ticket and here, here's your uh, your wristband and your amulet and your program. You know, we're not, we're not questioning people who they are. And then three, strip searches? I mean, come on. That's <laughs> just yeah. funny. Like pure ridiculous. Well, like you said, if point. anybody bothered to read the whole article, I mean, I, I think the first link to, to something else on that website was somebody dying from an atomic wedgie. So, you know, I, <laughs> come on, you know, consider your sources. It's like it's you know certain certain people they get off on creating these fake news stories. They don't just do it for the gathering. They do it they do it for whatever has a buzz. You know, whatever. Like right now, the gathering's got this like big ass buzz going. So they, they do it for stuff like that because they know that it's 
going to draw attention to it. You know what I mean? And that's all they do it for. It's like a big hoax. You know, they just want to stir shit up. You know, and and for the most part, in, in some ways, you can respect it a little bit. But for another, in another way, when it's something like that that's actually hurtful or damaging, then then that's just kind of lame. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, if you're going to hoax, that's one thing. But if you're going to do a hoax, it's going to try to spread fear and possibly keep people from coming. You know what I mean? It, it, it's definitely kind of stale. You know. For sure, the whole time at the uh, at Hog Rock uh, or Cave and Rock, we had we had a the spasmatic hangout. Uh, will there be something like equivalent to that, like a central location for people to meet up uh, at at Legend Valley? Because it didn't look like there's a uh, a spot like that on the timeline. Yeah, there is. There's, uh, there's what we call the Bizarro Tent. Okay. <laughs> now, the Bizarro Tent is is one of my. I don't, you know, I'm going to be straight out with you. I have no idea how it's going to go, but my vision of a uh, bizarre world is like, it, it's one of the things I got a lot of love for. And basically what bizarre world is, is this collection of entertainers that are all coming together every night from uh, midnight to four to, to, you know, to show off their craft. I mean, we got fire performers, magicians, jugglers, you know, like who, who, Ooh, dancers, you know what I mean, uh, uh, drum circle, you know what I mean, it's going to be playing drums, it's just like, and then there's bleachers set up outside of it, so it's like, it, it, you know, and then there's the tent that's right there, the big ass tent, right, where you can kind of sit in and watch it, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the bizarro tent is actually the equivalent of what the spasmatic hangout was, you know what I mean, it's just like, a, it's right in the heart of the gathering. And it's kind of like an area where people can kind of go and chill. And we have tables set up in there with chairs and everything. And then uh, at some at some times there's going to be uh, the the psychopathic radio will be going on during the day in there as well. But at night it's just a chill area, like you know what I mean. Like the, the, the rest of the time when psychopathic radio is not going on during the day, it's just a real chill area for people to like uh, to chill out in and watch watch the performers and everything. But yeah, bizarre world. I, I know we have about like uh, I think it's 24 performers there, and the thing is, is it's encouraged for for jugglers to join in. Like you know, we want we want others to come by and see it, and you know, if they have some kind of skill or talent, they can just jump in there. You know, it's a very social kind of like almost spiritual thing going on. You know, where people can get involved. You know, it's interactive. You know what I mean? It's there's no stage. It's just a big circle. You know what I mean? Uh, on the ground with some bleachers outside of it, and then uh, the tent to another side of it, and you know, and everybody just kind of like chilling out, like you know, watching or joining in. That sounds pretty you badass, know? man. It sounds different. Yeah, I'm, for sure. I'm, I'm excited about it. You know what I mean? It's like, and it's kind of like it creates the pulse and the beat of the gathering at night because it's it's like wherever you go, you have to kind of like pass by it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it was, it was really important. To, for that to be like the heartbeat of the gathering almost. You know what I mean? Like, you know, where it's like everybody can kind of get together and, and, and hang out together, you know what I mean? And, and just chill for a minute, you know, because there's so much excitement and high energy going on everywhere else, you know, all the way around it that I kind of wanted that spot, you know, where, where people can kind of chill out. You know what I mean? So, so you've, you've mentioned uh, several things that are happening at the gathering this year. Uh, between Cypress Hill, and you just talked about the Bizarro Tent and everything. What are you personally looking forward to? What one event or or artist are you personally looking forward to the most? All right, I want I want to say this first of all. Um, as far as artists go, you know, you know the the big names. I'm not even going to mention them. Like you know the big names, and I'm looking forward to all of them. You know what I mean? Like the the the, the headliners, like uh, you know, almost the entire roster that's on the main stage. But as far as, like, the kind of, like, uh, possibly lesser-known artists, uh, the one, one art, two artists that I'm really looking for, actually three artists that I'm really looking forward to seeing, because I've never seen it perform, is, uh, and, and, and hopefully this doesn't, like, you know, insult people or let them down, like, oh, I didn't mention me. You know? <laughs> because, like, I think all the artists that we have at the gathering are awesome because, you know, like, we wouldn't have brought them in if we didn't think very highly of them, but uh, some artists I'm really looking forward to seeing this year, one of them is Crucifix, who, right. uh, yeah, like, I, every video he's put out is just like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> this kid doing, you know, it's like a million-dollar video and shit, you know? 
And uh, as far as I know, he's doing everything on his own. You know, I mean, he was on the Boondocks album. Like, I called him up and talking to his manager, and they're just some cool-ass motherfuckers that got their shit together, you know? And, and he's got that, he's, like, got that shine. You know what I mean? He's fucking glowing to me. He's like, man, it's cute. He's like, you know, he's ready to pop, you know, in my opinion, you know. Um, another one is Wild Card. Yes. Like, uh, mm -hmm. now, guy last year, um, I don't know what I was doing, but I was somewhere at the gathering, right? And I I heard this rapper just fucking blow. <laughs> you know, I had to stop what I was doing and look in the program to see who the fuck it was. <laughs> so I was like, you know, like I, I couldn't, like I was so busy, I couldn't just go over there and actually see the performance, but, like, I actually had looked up his name in the program, like, who the fuck is this kid, you know? <laughs> it was just like, he was just like, he was just like a, uh, you know, chopper style, just, you know what I mean? And I looked it up, and I was like, man, what, that's Wild Card? I was like, all right, because he was playing during the day, you know, on one of the, one of the stages, and I was like, uh, you know, I just, I was just amazed at what I was hearing, but I couldn't, I couldn't stop and see his performance, so I'm trying to really see it this year. I, I definitely want to check him out. The other one is uh, another one is uh, Mr. Licks. Am I saying that right? Yes, yep, Licks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, you know, I, I recently became aware of him uh, at the gathering this year, and I think uh, I think we had a talk with him. I think you turned me on to him actually. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so you know, I was checking out his videos, you know, and, and of the three, he's really the only horrorcore artist on there, at least I, I consider horrorcore. Um, but he's he's amazing. You know what I mean? I was like, man, it's, he's got a really unique flow. And, uh, you know, to me, it's like, again, he's he seems like someone that can definitely pop. Like, you know, he could he could take it to that next level, you know. So it's like, and I, and I would say Playboy the Beast, but unfortunately he backed down this year for, yes. for some personal reasons, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was devastated uh, about that. Yeah, it was, you know, I was like, I, I was really looking forward to him, but um, maybe maybe next year, you know. Um, of the events now, of the events, oh, and one, one last thing uh, that I'm really excited is it's a main artist. I just have to mention this, because uh, La Coca Nostra, uh, I don't plan on missing that. <laughs> you no, know no. what I mean? Like, to me, to me the, the New York style of rap has always been... Uh, close to my heart is, is something that I really latch on to, and they definitely represent that New York style. And, uh, you know, everything that they put out to me is, is just amazing, you know what I mean? So, um, now, of the – oh, and one last thing, Gilbert Godfrey. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> I can't believe you guys booked him, but thank you so much for booking that guy. <laughs> yeah, you know. And, Huge and fan of him. It, yeah, it was – yeah, it's been weird. Like, the fact that, you know, he's doing the gathering, it just came together so easy because – you know, he, he did the ICP Theater. He did that episode of ICP Theater. So it's just like, you know, we already had that rapport working with him. You know what I mean? So it's like he was super down to do it. You know what I mean? It was just it fell in the place, like, real easy. I was like, wow, that's that's amazing, you know. But, uh, you know, I definitely uh, don't want to miss that. Um, but, yeah, you, were you going to say something? or? Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that I've, I've been a huge fan of his since, uh, you know, hearing his Howard Stern appearances and stuff. So that was, a, that was a definitely a treat for me to see that. Yeah, you know he does the uh, the comedy roast, and yes. uh, he, he's always the anchor for them things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And for good reason, because every time he comes on, I mean, you're just like rolling at that point. You're <laughs> just like, man, it just schools the fuck out of people so hard. You know, it's just great. But um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to him. You know, and he's very much engaged in the gathering too. Like his whole management team has been calling us, setting up interviews, and you know what I mean? Like really proactive about the gathering. So it's like uh, it's it's really cool to have him a part of that. Um, as far as events go this year, um, one of the main things that, that that I really have a lot of love for, and, and I almost feel uh, I almost feel uh, hesitant about bringing more heat to it, is the uh, the Ninja Olympics. You know, mm -hmm. um, the Ninja Olympics is a martial competition where juggles square off, uh, you know, one versus one uh, in the ring. You know. And, uh, the, like, the first round is a knife fighting competition. The second round is sumo wrestling. The third round is, is martial arts, you know, wearing pr protective vests and seven-ounce gloves. And then the, the final round is uh, pugil sticks, you know. Uh, there will only be two competitors that make it to the final round, but you basically have to endure a three-versus-one pugil stick battle 
and whoever can last the longest without getting knocked off their feet or hitting the ropes win. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and since we've announced that, now this is something, and believe me, I can rattle on about this for a long time, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, growing up as kids, like me and Joe, we used to do this kind of shit all the time. Like that was like we lived and breathed like ninja. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and like we used to have these like we used to have to, we used to do these games where you know we would go up to Seven Eleven, which might be like you know uh, a mile away, and we would go there at night with the objective of not being seen by anybody. You know what I mean? Just mm-hmm. stealthing through the through people's backyards and shit, and like you know what I mean? just waiting for traffic to clear, ninja across the street. We're dressed all in black, and then. We used to battle each other. We used to fight in the streets, you know, and we used to set up competitions like this. Then when I was in the military, I remember when I was in Saudi Arabia, we used to fight on these, at one point, we were in this desert that had these giant plateaus that came up. They were probably about, like, 30-foot diameter. They just jutted out out of the desert, and they were flat on top. And we used to go up there, uh, a bunch of us, like, it would be, like, 20 people would go up there, bring a bunch of bottled waters and canteens full of water and stuff. We used to stay out there for like sometimes like five hours just fighting. <laughs> and we would have like, we'd have flak vests on, right? Because that's part of your military history at the time because we were in a war. And we used to just go all out, you know, kicking, fighting, you know, punching as hard as you can. And it was all to the, to the vest though, you know, so nobody would get really crippled or seriously hurt. And uh, we used to do mock combat like that all the time. So I kind of took a combination of everything on those two things, and, and the Ninja Olympics was totally, at least in that respect, was my idea, and I was, like, you know, pitching it to everybody, and, and some people were feeling it, and some people weren't, but uh, when we announced it, since that time, I've gotten phone calls, and, uh, you know, uh, people emailing me, Ninjas emailing me, and they're basically saying, like, man, I've been training for this, <laughs> you know, hurts, but, you know what I mean, I bought pugil sticks, and I'm fighting, you know what I mean, Wow. and, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, other ninjas are like, man, you know, can, can I can I use smoke bombs? <laughs> can I use, like, <laughs> sex tricks? And I'm like, yeah, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, as long as you don't hurt your opponent, like, that's not what it's about, you know? Like, don't hurt your fucking opponent, man. That's all family, you know what I mean? That's your fucking brother or sister or whoever's in there. Don't fucking try to maim them, you know? But, you know, if, if you have, like, some, like, something to, to do a distraction or something in the middle of a fight, that's totally legit, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what ninjas are all about. But anyway, uh, we said on the in the program it says only 16 people, you know, like basically only 16 can perform, you know, which is, uh, you know, we, if we get 32 competitors, we'll, we'll run 32. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's just, it has to be set up on the pyramid style. You know what I mean? I don't know if you're familiar with it, but... Yes, sure. uh, 32 after round one there'll be 16 after round two there'll be eight you know it's gotta it's gotta like it's gotta go in that format in order for it to work so if we do get 32 juggalos that are down we'll run it you know what i mean but yeah so far it just seems like it's getting a lot of heat like like you know juggalos are really excited about it so and for those who uh, I'm, yeah for those who are going it's it looks like it's happening uh the saturday the last day of the gathering at noon uh, at the jcw stage so so yeah, was, uh, noon to one o'clock. Yep. Yeah, it was one of the run, but uh, it's something we never did before at the gathering. So I'm curious to see how it's going to go. And, uh, and 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 I'm like, and, and again, apologize for rambling on. But uh, another thing that I that I really like is the Juggalo Gong Show because we put a lot of love into that. And I'm not going to really say anything about that except that uh, we did put a lot of love into it and effort into it. And uh, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be very entertaining. <laughs> so, you know, we got Chuck Barras, uh from the infomercial. He's going to be hosting it. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely would like to see that as well. Let's see how that goes off. Awesome. Okay. All right. So so last year, uh, the Miss Juggalette pageant was uh, was revamped. Uh, what can we expect from the Miss Juggalette pageant this year, and what are you looking forward to about it? Okay. So... So last year with the with the Miss Juggalette pageant, uh, you know, I was dealing with Let's Respect. You know, they had contacted me and basically uh, were saying that they were kind of like fed up with everything that was going on. And, and I totally, like, I totally feel what they're talking about. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's like, like, I respect what they're about. You know what I mean? Like, there's these juggler organizations like Let's Respect and FCU. It's like, I feel what they're about. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, you know, like, I want to, you know, show respect to them, you know what I mean, and what they got going on, because I really like what they're doing, 
You know what I mean? They're helping out family directly. They're trying to, in, in, in the uh, in the case of Let's Respect, like they're trying to elevate the status of, of Jug Let's, you know what I mean? So they're not, uh, you know, they're not, like, looked at as, like, you know, they're trying to they're trying to change the image, in other words, you know what I mean? Because, like, um, you know, and, and and I respect what they're doing, you know what I mean? Like, I, like I see what they're doing, and, and I respect it. You know, so there's a place for that. Like the wet t-shirt contest is wild as you want. <laughs> you know, so it's all wild, but in all aspects of it, it doesn't need to be that. But the the thing is, like, the, what the Miss Juggalette pageant used to be back in the day, uh, it was very much what it is now, which was it was a real contest. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, it has three rounds. There's the uh, there's a round where they get asked a question, and then there's a talent round, and then there's the swimsuit round. You know what I mean? And um, Somewhere down the line, the Juggalette pageant had evolved until it was just this thing with, like, you know, all the contestants get naked. <laughs> you know, the time. What's wrong with that? Like, if a Juggalette wants to get up there and that's what they want to do for their talent, like strip or something like that, then, you know, we're not saying, no, you can't do that. You know, do whatever talent you want to do. You know what I mean? Uh, and so we're not saying there's, you know, I'm not trying to say there's something wrong with stripping. It's just... You know, the, the, the problem with years past is you had certain MCs that were, like, pressuring the girls to do this, you know what I mean? And it, it was almost, like, evil, you know what I mean? Like, like turning the crowd against them if they didn't get naked and stuff like that, you know? And so that's one thing that I don't want to see happen. Like, I, I'm definitely against. Like, And the thing is, when they contacted me, you know, I, I already had the contest back to what it was before. You know what I mean? Like, so it was like, yeah, you, you know, 100%. You know, like, I was... You know, listen to all the concerns, but I, I was already changing it back to that anyway. You know, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, sexy ass jugglers that are going to be getting up there and doing their thing, and you know what I mean. But it, it shouldn't be to the point where they're getting pressured into doing stuff they don't want to do. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like they should be able to go up there and do whatever talent they want to do. They should, you know, and and some of the some of the questions are risque. You know what I mean? Some of the questions are like R rated or. You maybe even border on X rated, but they're not all that. You know what I mean? That's not all it's about. It's it's, it's the uh, to me it's a reflection of like uh, you know what the judge like queen should be. You know she she does she have personality? Does she have talent? Is she is she hot? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know it's like, you know it's, it's all things personified of that title. You know and to me now the contest is a, a direct reflection of that. You know what I mean? Definitely. So. Yeah, so I'm I'm I like what it is, and and it's uh, and and you know I mean I and I would like to look out for our jugglets, you know, and um and it's something that I think uh, I think now it's like a, it's it's an awesome thing, you know what I mean how the, how the contest is now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Why isn't Legs Diamond and the Purple Gang uh, on the timeline for this year's gathering? Oh, but yeah. Originally, we totally had it set up for. You know, Legs Diamond and the Purple Gang, they perform at the gathering. They're, uh, I, you, you all seen them in the infomercial. Uh, but unfortunately, due to personal reasons, he's not able to, to perform at the gathering this year. And it's, uh, it's very upsetting to me. <laughs> like, you know, um, you know, I, I try very hard to, like, you know, like, since, since we put the gathering together, there's been, a few artists that, you know, had problems or had to switch around, you know, the dates or whatever. And, and believe me, we accommodate in every way we can because the last thing we want to see is somebody not show up and supposed to perform. You know, everybody right now is 100% confirmed and locked in. The timeline that you see is 100% locked in, and we're good to go. But if somebody were to try to back out, believe me, on our end, we try everything in our power uh, to do whatever we can to keep them, you know, in the lineup and keep them there. Uh, unfortunately for Leg Diamond, that that wasn't even possible, and uh, he's just not going to be able to make the gathering this year. And it, it was kind of like a bomb that was dropped on us, you know, late into the game, like you know, um, after the infomercial was filmed and everything. So uh, he'll be back next year, I'm sure, but he just couldn't make it. You know, there's, there's certain things that just crop up that uh, you know just make it impossible to, to show up. You know? so, and it's such a huge, uh, it's such a huge event. I think that uh, you know that, that you know it's it's going to happen each year. I mean, it's happened every year pretty much mm-hmm. where somebody wasn't able to make it. But uh, but yeah, unfortunately, that's the case this year. Okay, so uh, along the same lines, uh, there's also no mention of the deadly medley, which is what typically what the gathering closes out with. 
was yeah. there was there any reasoning behind that? Yeah, we wanted to do. Uh, we we talked Ron and Ron about doing the deadly medley this year, and because the way we got it lined up, we're kind of looking at it almost like Bloody Mania Eight. Now is like the final conclusion, and I don't, I'm not saying that that's fresh. I'm not saying we'll never do the deadly medley again. You know, definitely we want to do it, but. I, I, yeah, the deadly medley just kind of like, you know, again, we kind of listen to everybody. We have big meetings about this stuff, and it's just kind of like how it came out to be uh, this year. And um, But, yeah, I agree. I really like the deadly medley, and I was definitely uh, voting for it this year. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of like how I was kind of foreseeing things ending as well because it's kind of like a big kickoff, you know. It's just that, you know, and the thing that's weird with the deadly medley every year is like because we used to have it on Sunday – a lot of people were gone already. <laughs> you know? yeah. It was like you know, a much smaller crowd, like kind of almost more intimate, you know, affair. And I think that's why why Juggalos really liked it. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just kind of. And I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't even remember all the final reasons behind it. But it was, uh, yeah, it just kind of got left left out this year. And, and kind of like Bloody Mania Eight, and uh, it's kind of like the final, you know, the final send off. Uh, for the gathering this year. Okay, we got actually got quite a few questions about the 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 kind of the unofficial start of the gathering or the parking lot parties the the day before uh, the, the day before the gathering officially starts. So, are we gonna have any any issues having those uh, in the parking lot of Legend Valley this year? Yeah. Okay. The parking lot parties, <laughs> you know, they're uh, they're definitely problematic for us on the logistics side of things. Like we, you know, we definitely do not encourage ninjas to uh, show up early for this thing. Um, but you know, every year it, it happens. You know, so uh, there is a parking lot, as you've seen on the map. Um, and uh, I, the only thing I'm going to say officially about that, and believe me, like I, I can't really reveal everything. I, I, all I can say is I really discourage people from doing that. It does create logistically, it creates a lot of problems for us. And um, and we we definitely discourage it, but um, you know, at the same time, we're not really trying to give people the bone either. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, it's like you try to do the best you can and try to make it work the best you can. But uh, the one thing I I'll definitely say is that I, I discourage people from showing up early if they can. Okay. <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, okay. So that pretty much covers everything that I've got as far as the gathering, but I do have some other uh, non-gathering related questions for you, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Um, okay, so a lot of people want to know about uh, where you are as far as your, your musical career. Are you, are you going to be doing another Legs Diamond album? Will you be doing another uh, Jump Study solo album, uh, etc.? Um, yeah, my intentions was definitely to do an album uh, last year, mm-hmm. and then the uh, problem with it is that it's just like the, the sheer amount of work, like the volume of work over here at Psychopathic, keeping everything going that we have going right now. I mean, this this year in particular, you know, we have the box set coming out, we got uh, Psychopathic's the video of volume two coming out, you know, we got Dark Lotus coming out, we got we got super groups coming out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just like. It's just crazy, like, the, the, just the sheer amount of work. So there's just physically no time. And on top of that, like, it's always real hard for me to to do music. You know, it doesn't come, like, naturally. Like, I can't just go in and write a song and record it in an hour. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't have that skill set, you know. Uh, it's never been my super ambition to really be an artist, like, on the other side of that fence. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I... I love the albums that I put out because I felt like I had something to say. You know what I mean? And uh, and especially like the Master of Flying Guillotine, like I feel like that was a big representation of really who I am as a person. Because I touch upon different things from like role playing, you know, to uh, to revenge, you know, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And you know, and then the the song If, you know, where you know talk about like you can't you can't really second guess everything you do in life, you know, it's just what happened, like, don't dwell on it, like, that, that can cripple you, you know what I mean, <laughs> if you're thinking, like, oh, I wish I would have done this, or if I would have done that, you, you know, you just got to accept how life unfolds and, like, push ahead, so it was, like, it was all stuff that, you know, I really felt like I had a lot to say on those albums, and I loved doing them, but 
my ambition has never been to be on the stage. You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, my ambition has never been uh, to, to even be doing what I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just these interviews and stuff, you know. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't I appreciate, I, I think they're important, and I, you know, to, to keep keep everyone informed, and, and I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. But, um, you know, that's never really been my driving force, so I would like to do another album. Like, I, I feel like I have uh, a lot that I, that I would like to put down, onto songs, uh, but it all comes down to, like, when am I going to have the time? Like, the Master of the Flying Guillotine, that took me about a half a year to do. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And that was, like, you know, working pretty seriously on it, you know? Like, I would I would probably, you know, at least, like, four days out of the week sit down and try to write and, you know, record songs and scrap songs and, you know, try to come up with some beats and stuff. And, you know, it just it, it doesn't come easy to me. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I'm such a perfectionist, you know? Like, everything has to be, like, perfect in order for me to feel good about it, you know? Um, so, yeah, as far as another album, I would love to do it, but I don't really know when I'm going to have the time to actually sit down and do it. So, okay. it's, at this point, I would like to say that it's questionable <laughs> that uh, that I would ever do, uh, do another album, like a full-on album, you know? Like, something would have to change, you know? Uh, when I did the Master of the Flying Guillotine, like I wasn't technically, I wasn't even really at Psychopathic at that time. Like you know, that was like kind of like the period where I left, and, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, I had all this free time. <laughs> so I started working on that and other projects, you know, that I was still working on for Psychopathic. Like I always worked with Psychopathic, like writing for them and other stuff like that. So you know, but it was like I was very much on the outside of the loop at that point when I when I did that album. And it was because of that, because I was on the outside, that I was able to have all the time to do a project like that. Well, what do you think about another spoken word album like The Road? Okay. The Road, um, I don't really know, like, people's reaction. <laughs> like, I don't know. Really? I'm, I'm, I've heard nothing yeah. but, but greatness, I, I mean, from, from anybody that I've asked or talked to about it. I mean, it's, it's like an extension of... Uh, of the 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 story described in uh, in behind the pain it was it was really cool to hear it from uh, from your perspective. I know, like my my brother has a, a lot of love for that album, mm-hmm. and I, I have love for it too. But it it was hard to do because, like in the in the past, like those stories, like all, all the stories that I have, like a, like amongst my you know closest friends, like I'm I'm renowned as a storyteller. Like, you know, like, uh, especially when we're doing, like, a long drive, like, when it, when I feel like it, I can start flowing with story, you know, because I, I live my life uh, with that in mind, like, you know, to, to try to experience as much as I can, you know. It's one of the reasons that I joined the Army. You know, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to be at EMT. It was one of the reasons why I love working at Psychopathic, because you have so many experiences that just happen to you, you know, that stand out in your head, you know, that, like, are a page in your book of life, you know. So I have, like, all these stories. And believe me, like, when I get to, to talk, and I can just be <laughs> nonstop, <laughs> you know, like, like, 10 hours straight, you know. Like, when I take a, 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 dr- a drive out to the Bronx and visit my family out there with my wife and, and daughter and stuff, you know, I'll just be <laughs> nonstop, you know. So I'm kind of re- renowned for that. But it was difficult sharing those stories in that setting, like having to go into a studio and you're not really talking to somebody. You almost have to visualize you're talking to somebody in order for that story to come across, you know. And it, it, was, it was very difficult for me. Like, you know, we had to uh, turn all the lights out in the studio and, and you know, uh, I lit a bunch of candles <laughs> and shit, you know, trying to, try to get like a mood set you know, in order to to tell those stories, you know. But it, it, I was worried about it because at some points, like, we kept on having to retake it because it just wasn't natural. Like, I, ha- I had to really get into a mindset that I was sharing it with somebody because typically typically I, I, I only sh- would share personal stories with, like that with somebody that I love, you know, mm-hmm. somebody that I knew that was listening, that would care about what I had to say. But the thing is, is, like, with with the road, like I was able to do that because there's like this universal love amongst jugglers. 
You know what I mean? It's just like it, it, it made it, it. It was my hope that my stories had some kind of weight. You know, the Juggalos would hear that and be like, you know, feel those stories, like because in some way they either know me but they met me or they feel they know me. So it would it would create some kind of weight for them, and, and you know, the words would have some kind of weight for them, and, and that was my. That was my motivating factor, and the only reason I was able to do that. Like, if I was just putting out that album just for whoever, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But even with that in mind, it was still it was difficult because you know I wasn't actually seeing the person that I was talking to. <laughs> you know, just yeah, like, you couldn't judge their reactions you know, or anything. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like like any good story. It's like it's like a conversation. It kind of builds. You know, like. You know, you're saying something, and then and somebody contributes in, and you just, you know, and that fuels you in another direction and stuff. And it's like, there was none of that. It was just quiet yeah. <laughs> in the studio. You know, you're just talking. So uh, it's hard to explain. And uh, uh, but yeah, as far as doing another one, I could definitely see, see doing that. And that's something that it's not very. I mean, it was time consuming, but not crazy time consuming. You know what I mean? It was like a lot of the work was done in post. Like it was done afterwards. Like all I had to do was tell the story. Mm-hmm. You know, well, usually how we do it is like after work. You know, I would go in there and be nighttime, and I would tell a story. And then, and then, you know, Joe would work his magic with Kuma, and they would just like put the all the sound effects and all that devastation here and there, and like they would add all that. You know what I mean? And then I would come down, and listen to it, and put my two cents here or there. You know, and. um and so, you know, you get the end result, you know, <clears throat> which, uh, yeah, I wasn't really sure how, how ninjas were, if they were feeling it or not, because I didn't really get a lot of feedback from and I really them. dug it, and, and I think you need a podcast or something, bro, because <laughs> it sounds like you got yeah. you, you get a lot you got to say, so. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Like, uh, yeah, this whole thing with the, uh, the Juggalo show, like, as soon as we get uh, the radio up and running again, uh, that was that was basically the mindset was, that uh, me and Rudy, with they, uh, me and Root Boy, basically run <laughs> run a show, you know, at least every every two weeks or so. Which is uh, again, it's something very alien to me. I've never done it before, but you know, I'd give it a try. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You know. So, because you brought up Psychopathic Radio, what is the status of it? Because you know, like it's been pushed off several times, and people kind of want to know. Yeah, the status of it right now is uh, unfortunately it's on hold. Um, you know, with everything that, again, with everything that we got going on this year, uh, you know, we just don't have, we don't have the, 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 the people to do it. <laughs> we don't have like the ninjas to sit down and dedicate time to that. Um, I don't know, like, I don't know if any, if ninjas even realize this, but like the extent of our gathering hit last year. Uh, you know, we're steadily paying off the debt still from that from that gathering. Like it, it was a pretty big loss last year, and uh, because of that, like so we had to kind of downsize Psychopathic Records a little bit. You know what I mean? Like we have we have the people to run it now, like a really efficient, really good team. You know, super hard, super dedicated ninjas here right now. But uh, because of that hit we took at the gathering last year, you know, we had to we had to make some changes. But now everything's on like the upswing. You know what I mean? Like this year is turning out extremely good, and uh, financially we're we're in a really good place right now. And the gathering this year is definitely not gonna not gonna be hurting. You know, it's like like I said, it's uh, the pre sales are double right now. We're double ticket sales where we were last year. You know, so I'm extremely happy with that. And then. Um, you know, and then with all these releases we got coming out with Boondocks and Axe Murder Boys and, and Dark Lotus, I mean, we're like, you know, everything is going really good right now. So, uh, you know, we're we're now like in, in a stage where we're hiring people back. So, oh good. Uh, we've been talking about we've been talking about uh, the radio station extensively, and we realized that we need to get it up. Like, we want to get it up because. It's uh you know it's a really it's a really way it's a really good way to stay connected to the family like you know when when you field calls and stuff and like you know just like keeping everybody informed and it, it's just a really good tool you know and it's one of those things it's like a loss it's like it's like a loss for us you know financially <laughs> you know we never really made any money off it but it's one of those things that you you have to do you know like it's like 
it's just such a, a, a cool thing to, you know, to stay connected to the family and to, to give back to the family, and, you know what I mean? And, and so, uh, so yeah, the, the radio room is 100% ready to go, by the way. <laughs> it's like, like we, got, we got the new radio room up and it's up and running, you know, it's just that uh, it still takes somebody to, to actually organize it, you know what I mean, to set up the shows every day because it's a, the, the show that we have in mind is like a production. You know, like we want to run like the the weekly freaky type thing. Like every time we run the show, like you know, with like you know, uh, Sugar Slam doing the news, and we want we want people out there like like almost like you know live reporters on the streets doing interviews and stuff. Oh, that would like, be sweet, man. I like yeah, that. we got a, we got a lot of ideas for it. You know, it's like they're all right there. It just it, it just takes somebody with the time to sit down and, and really run it. You know, and and, uh, and I, I apologize it's been taking this long. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things we keep saying, okay, after the gathering, like we're, we're just putting so much energy and effort into the gathering right now that a lot of this stuff we're like, okay, after the gathering, this is happening. You know what I mean? So, like, after the gathering, it's going to alleviate a lot of the, the, the pressure that's on us as a company right now. It'll alleviate a lot of that pressure, and we'll be able to move ahead and do all these things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, I'll that we want to do, including the radio. Like, that's that's very important to us. So um, I would say uh, the only thing I could say right now is shortly after the gathering, uh, the radio should be up and running. Like, within a month after the gathering, it should definitely be up and running. Cool, cool, very cool. I, I did want to cover the, the the time in your life that you left psychopathic uh, to, to pursue be, becoming an EMT. What made you want to leave the label to, to pursue that, and uh, and what made you come back to the label? Okay, that's a really long story. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you want to yeah, do it. I mean, I think people are really interested about it. If you're if you're willing to tell it, yeah, I definitely want to tell it. All right, uh, all right. So what happened with with me leaving the the record label was that um, it was uh, way back in the day when Alex Abbott was still the CEO of Psychopathic Records, and he came into my office and he asked me. He said, "Look, we have." Uh, this sister company that was starting out uh, called Psychopathic, uh, uh, you know, Psychopathic uh, Europe. And, mm-hmm. he, and he asked me if I would head it up, like the whole thing, like go over to Europe and head it up and all that. And, you know, I thought about it for like a day and I said, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> at the time, my, my daughter was real young and, you know what I mean? And like I, I just didn't want to be gone for a year. He, he, the plan was to send somebody over there for a year, you know, just freaking it. You know what I mean? Like, nonstop. Like, get it all up and running, you know? And I knew something like that would be all-consuming, you know what I mean? And it would be super hard, you know? And I, at the time, I just didn't want to be away from my family for a year, you know? So I told him no. So there was this other this other ninja that was working for us. Uh, I'm not going to say his name. But uh, so he started heading it up, you know? And he, he set it all up. Like, he actually hired European employees. Uh, he got a warehouse over there, like an office attached to a warehouse, very similar to the building we have here, just a little bit smaller. And uh, he was working on distribution uh, and everything else over there. So he, he pretty much spent a year getting it all situated. Then he went over there. You know, the day finally came where he was going to go over there and start running it. So, and the idea was to build it, you know what I mean, like build it just like over here, like how, how we got things popping over here, like build it over there in Europe, because it was already like a really good buzz, you know, over there. It was already starting to build, you know. So he went over there, and he lasted one day. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and next thing we know, he's on a plane coming back. And we're like, what's going on? You know, and, and he came up with some bullshit story that his girlfriend was pregnant, he just found out he has to come home. And uh, our response to that was like, okay, your girlfriend's pregnant, but she's not going to get birth for like nine months. <laughs> can, you, you know, can you just give us a couple weeks to find somebody before you head back? And he was like, no, i got to come back right now. So he, he was on a plane straight back, and uh, we found out the truth later, talking to the European generals over there, it was uh, Paul, Steve, and Pizza. And, uh, you know, we, we talked to them over there, and, and he said, man, as soon as that guy got off the plane, all he could talk about was drugs. He was trying to find the hookup, and if they knew how to, if he, you know, if they knew how to get it, you know what I mean. And they were like, "Man, we, we don't know nothing about no drugs," you know. So basically, he was just like a crackhead, 
And uh, we didn't know this, but he was addicted to drugs. And I don't remember what drugs he was on, but he was addicted to some drugs. And when he found out he couldn't get them over there easily in Europe, he came straight back to get his fix. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it all fell apart. Next thing I know, Alex pops into my office. He's like, you have to go. You have to go to Europe. So I'm like... All right, you know what I mean. You can't let any, you know, you can't let everybody down. You know what I mean. We've been like hyping it and stuff. So, and I was the only one remotely qualified uh, to take that position. And believe me, I'm not saying I was qualified. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I was just like, I was like, I'll do, I'll do my best. You know. So I went over there, and I spent about eight months uh, trying to keep that company up and running. Now, if you can imagine the pressure of starting a brand new company from scratch, okay. That's uh, if you can even imagine the pressure and the work and the dedication you have to put into that. All right, now add on to the complexity that you're in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't know how shit works over there. You know, it's like everything's new. You know what I mean? It's like even how they do taxes and everything. It's just all like you know, it was so difficult. You know what I mean? And uh, it, it was just nonstop work. It's like you know, like pretty much how. I would work just like I'm working right now on the gathering. I would work uh, nonstop until it's time to go to sleep, and then I'd go to sleep, wake up, and start working again, trying to figure shit out, like how, how things work. So, and I had a really good group of ninjas over there, you know. Uh, you know, we hired all European jugglers, and they were super down for the cause and, and had a lot of motivation. So that was the only thing that really kept my sanity is uh, leaning on them a little bit. And uh, the problem was uh, psychopathic on that at that time was not, supportive of psychopathic Europe, you know. In other words, like, I would call to try to talk to Alex and stuff, and I started getting, you know, uh, oh, Alex was in a meeting. <laughs> or, <laughs> or, you know, Alex stepped out of the office, and I, I'm like, you know, what? <laughs> Are you serious right now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and you know, I started getting those all the time, and it was like, the, the problem was that, in America, they had so much going on that they didn't have time for psychopathic Europe. You know, that, that's the truth of it. They, they didn't have time for me, you know. And uh, Alex, he was kind of like the brain behind psychopathic, like building it up into what it, what it was. He was always the businessman, you know. He was like, uh, like I was more like the guy that was like creating events or putting ideas or, or, or you know, tour managing or you know what I mean, and, and stuff like that. Like, I was more, like, creative, and and I was always, like, you know, looking out for the Juggalos, like, how can we make this event fresher? You know, how can, how can, how can we make this better for Juggalos, you know, for our family? And Alex was more like the money man, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He was more like, how can we, you know, make money? How can we do this business? And, and, and those two extremes, we work really well as a partnership, you know what I mean? Because we met in the middle somewhere. Because if we would have done shit my way, we, you know, it would, we would have went out of business. <laughs> but, you know, if we would have done it completely Alex's way, there would have been no heart. You know what I mean? So, like, together, you know, we met in the middle, and with Joe, Joe was like, you know, he was there too. Like, he was, like, seeing all sides. And, you know what I mean? And he was always, like, busting ass, you know, making shit happen. And uh, But anyway, so I was over there, and, you know, nobody was returning my calls and everything. And so it, it got really difficult because I needed a lot of advice. You know, because I was kind of lost over there. So as time started going on, um, it was a big money tip because we were trying to, like, you know, put on shows and to promote that we were over there and, uh, you know, do all these things, which was taking money. Like, in the beginning of any business, it takes money to make money. You know, you have to keep putting it in. It's one of the reasons why Psychopathic was so successful and still remain successful because we know this. Like, we keep putting money back in. It's not like, you know, we get an income of money and we're fucking buying cars and shit and walking around with, like, you know, gold toilets or something. It's like we get money <laughs> in and, we're like, okay, we got this money, let's do a video. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's going right back out again. It's why it's why it seems like, you know, there's there's so much going on in Psychopathic because there is, because we're taking all the money that's coming in and we're putting it right back out for entertainment, you know, keep it all going, like, you know, provide that entertainment to the family. Anyway, so without any, it got to the point where uh, Alex didn't want to send me any money at all. Like, you know, it, it, and when he did send money, it was sporadic. Like, I would be like, all right, I need, like, 20,000 pounds, which was, like, $40,000, you know? <laughs> it's like, I need it because, like, you know, we're, 
you know, this is this is the projected, uh, you know, expenses for the month, and, you know, I got payroll and everything else. And weeks, sometimes months would pass, and then you'd send over, like, half of it. <laughs> it was like, you know, and, uh, and so I'd call them up, and, you know, when it when it got to its worst, um, when it when it got to its worst was when, um, you know, I had at one point I actually had to borrow money from my employees just so I could get something to eat. No <laughs> <I shit. swear. laughs> yeah. Because you know, because Alex, man, he just well, he just abandoned me over there. You know what I mean? And it's like, and Alex is like my childhood friend and stuff, and. I have a lot of love for that kid and a lot of respect, but I, I swear, man, like, I don't know what happened over there, but I just got left hanging. You know, the only people that really supported what I was doing was my brother who came over there. He spent about a month over there, and he was like, you know, he was just like he is over here, just super, you know, schooling it, trying to do whatever he could, come up with fresh ideas, you know what I mean? Like, he, he's, he's incredible, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the, the, uh, the, create, the creativity and the energy uh, of my brother is just I've never ever to this day met anybody like him, and um, you know have yet to meet somebody like him. You know what I mean? It has his level of motivation and, and, and dedication or something. And then uh, Tom, Tom too, Tom Lumberg came over and he helped out for a while and he was awesome. You know, so um, you know those two ninjas were the only ones that really supported what we were doing over there. But other than that, I felt like psychopathic just kind of like left me out to dry over there, and it was all because of Alex. You know. And um, the straw that finally broke the camel's back for me was the... Are, are you familiar with the game Quest for Shangri-La? Sure, yeah, definitely. Okay, so I made a prototype for that game, Quest for Shangri-La, mm -hmm. and sent it to Psychopathic, and, you know, I overnighted it because I was like, look, the guy's got to play test this game because a lot of, at the time, there was a lot of nerdies up at the office, like they're gamers. And I'm like, you guys got to play test this game and tell me how to make it better. You know what I mean? Like, I need somebody to look at this and, and, and play test it. So I sent it over there, and so a week passes, and I call up, hey, have you, have you guys had a chance to play test it? Oh, no. You know what I mean? I haven't got around to it yet. You know, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. You know what I mean? So then a month passes, and I keep calling. I'm like, look, man, I, I want to make this game. I want to get it. I want to. I just need to know what needs to change, and then I plan on putting this game out. You know, I had, I had a super passion for it. So anyway, about three months passed, and I finally gave a call to this one guy who used to work for a company, and we had a big falling out because he finally told me, not only did they not, not play test it, but he never even brought it to anybody's attention. It, it, it had been sitting under his desk for three months, oh. and he didn't even bring it to others' attention. Like, he didn't say, you know, here's <laughs> this game. Like, he just didn't, like, give a fuck. You know what I mean? And, man, I was so irate. Like, I was just... All right, so that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the pressure of being over there. We're trying to run a company in a foreign country. No money and no support. Literally no support from Psychopathic. And, brother, I just cracked like an egg. Mm -hmm. like, I, like, mentally, I just cracked. You know what I mean? It was just way too much. I, I was letting employees go. You know, it came down to just me and uh, Steve. Is his name was uh, Paul. His name was ATF Barkley. Yeah, I that was that was his rap name. It was just me and him over there every day, and uh, you know, putting in twenty hours a day. And it was just like, you know, finally I called. I finally, you know, called Alex up, and I'm like, I'm like, man, this is this is what it is, man. Like. You know, we're down to two employees over here. You're not supporting anything we got going on. And I said, uh, it's a big money pit, and it's going to be that way for about another year. What do you want to do? And he, he finally made the call to pull the plug on it. And I came home. Now, when I came home, um, they were working on NC Breed. Okay. And uh, it, was, it was about the time when they were going to put out NC Breed. And... I was shocked because nobody ran anything by me. Like, I, at that time, I very much looked at Psychopathic like, that's my company, too, you know? Like, like I'm a dime, you know what I mean? Like, like we were, uh, back in the day, we used to have a ranking system, and, like, there was five dons that were, like, the main people running the label, and I was one of them. And when I got back, it was like, yeah, okay, we were spending this ridiculous amount into MC3. And I said, 
why? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why? And mad love to MC Breed, man, and super respect and rest in peace. You know what I mean? I have super love for him as an artist. But at the time, he had a radio hit out. It was all over the radio. It was called In the Club or something like that. It was super hit. Like, it was on every radio station, especially in, like, the, the, the Michigan area. And yet he was still flopping. Like, nobody was buying his album. And I was like, why do you think this is going to work? And on top of that, you know, you're, you're sick and they, they put ridiculous, I don't even want to tell you how much money they put into that project. I was like, you're sick and all this money into it and nobody ever ran it by me. It's like, the way I was kind of looking at it was, you know, you're spending this money without, you know, it's my money too, you know, it's like I should have a say in how we're doing this, how where our resources are going, you know what I mean? It's my, it's my company, you know what I mean, as well. And uh, so everybody kind of took the stand and they're like, well, we're doing this. You know, and so that's when I finally, because of what happened in Europe, I was already really mentally unbalanced. I just bounced. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I was okay. like, I was like, you know, I had a meeting with everybody, and I mean, it was very respectful. I had a meeting with everybody, and I said, "Look, psychopathic Europe was not my dream. It was not my idea." And then I went over there, and I was like, "Alex, you basically left me hanging over there for a year, you know, and without no support." And know? after he told you to go <laughs> over there. And that, that's yeah, the, and the funny part. Me over. Right. You know, you're the one that sent me over there. Mm -hmm. and it was your vision. Like, it was really all Alex's vision. Like, he brought it up, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of, like, decided we were going to do it, you know, try it. But it was really his thing until until it got in my hands. And then it was like, it was like he passed the ball and just shut the door on me. And there was, like, it was, like, 20 tacklers, you know, <laughs> just all coming at me, and I was just left alone, you know, with no defense. And, um, you know, he just passed the ball on me and left me, you know what I mean? So, it, like, I just cracked. And then when I got back and the MC3 thing was going on, that was that was really the final straw. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a quest for law, and then there was that. And then I was like, and sure enough, MC3 came out, and unfortunately, he flopped. Like, he, he, he was, like, one of the worst sellers of all time for us. You know, as an artist, and uh, you know, and, and, and I was trying to use logic. I was like, if he had this super hit all over the radio and he didn't sell, what makes you think we're going to be able to do anything with him? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like I just didn't understand it. But um, but it was mostly, you know, that clo I spent close to a year in Europe. Uh, you know, and I just cracked like an egg. You know, so so then I started thinking about what I wanted to do next and EMS. It's something I always wanted to do, like be a paramedic or be a nurse. It was like, it was a dream of mine from way back when I was a kid, basically. <laughs> so it was something I always wanted to do. So I started looking into that, and the next thing I know, uh, you know, I, I was going to school for it. And the next thing you know, I'm on the road, and that's a whole other million stories. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doing it. yeah, I could talk for hours about that. But uh, so what made me decide... Uh, the other part of your question, what made me decide to come back? Yeah. There was three things that made me want to come back. One was, the, and again, I was never 100% gone. I want you to know that. Like when I left, I gathered everybody together, explained why I was leaving. It was very respectful. And I was like, I have to step away from this. You know, like mentally I'm very unbalanced right now. And it's hard to look at certain people's eyes. Like, all the people I had trouble with back then are no longer working here, you know. <laughs> They've all gone. But, uh, you know, I, I have trouble just, like, interacting with people at the office because I had so much anger, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately Alex is one of them, you know. And so I was like, you know, I was like, no, nah, i got to step away from this, you know. This is, like, this is not mentally healthy for me anymore. I don't feel like I have the 100% heart. Like, I didn't want to do it because I didn't have the 100% heart. Like, you know, when you're doing something like psychopathic, you got to have 100% heart. You know, there's so many, so many ninjas, you know, like jugglers relying on you, you know, that are, that are, you know, you know, you, have, you know, and then on top of that, just, you know, being in this environment, it's like you got to pull your weight because everybody you're working with are your friends. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's a very close-knit group up here. It's like we're all homies. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, you have to have 100% heart or you're, you're dishonoring yourself and everybody else. You know, it's like, it's like a, you know, so anyway, uh, so yeah, so what made me decide to want to come back was um, when we did uh, Big Money Wrestling. 
and we did the movie premiere in Detroit. Right, so we had every actor come out on stage, like one at a time. They got announced and they came out on stage uh, before the movie premiered, you know, before they even showed the movie. And maybe it was my imagination, but when they when they called out my name, you know, Jump Steady, I feel like I got, like, probably as big as a pop as anybody else in there. Like, the, you know, the crowd went crazy. Like, yeah, it was man, crazy. Missed, I'm sure. Yeah, it was like, I was, like, shocked. Like, I had no idea. Like, you know, to me, it was, like, it was just such a re... It was such a hitting home of, like, this is fucking for real. You know what I mean? Like, this is fucking family. Like, in family, you are never forgotten. You know what I mean? Like, when it comes down to, like, a, a true family, you don't just forget somebody because they're in jail for, like, five years or they went off somewhere for, you know what I mean? It's like, there's always that love that's there, and it's eternal, and it just remains. You know what I mean? And it's like, and, and when I, when, when they called my name out there, it was a lot of anxiety for me because I was like, I was like, does anybody even, even remember who I am? You know what I mean? Like, there's so many new faces, you know, it's like, you know, it's just like I wasn't really even sure what to expect. And, you know, they haven't even seen the movie yet, you know, and it was, it was just a super big pop. And I was like, I don't know, that just really moved me, you know, it's like, that was incredible. That whole night was incredible. And, and the whole thing with Big Money Rustlers was that was a dream of mine. Like, I, I just really wanted to do part two to that movie. Like, you know, I was always pushing that. You know, and then, you know, and the big factor was, you know, it cost millions of dollars to do a movie like that, and there's no way it's going to make money back. So that was, like, the biggest thing to always, there's always this hurdle to do one of those movies, but it's like, man, we got to do this fucking movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and, and to be a part of that and come, and even filming the movie was awesome because, you know, I was with my brother again and everybody, and it was just mad respect and love, and it was, it was a really good time. And, and I took on, like, a director's role on that. I wasn't a director, but I was like, I guess you could say like an, almost like an assistant director. Like I was always there behind the director, making sure everything was being shot right because that's how that's how Joe is. Like he wants somebody, like he wants me to be overseeing that to make sure they're not trying to film something whack, you know. So I was always up at the crack of dawn when everybody else is still sleeping, like sitting behind the camera and, and sometimes coming up with ideas or telling them no, don't do that or you know. But it was mostly. You know, it was mostly Paul's vision and stuff. Like, he, he did most of it. But if I saw something going wrong, I was right there, you know. So, anyway, it was just a really, really good thing. The other the other thing that really wanted me to come back was uh, doing the gatherings again. Like, I came back and I did two gatherings before I came back to Psychopathic. And I'm not really good with years and stuff. I know it was like, I don't know, it was like four or five years ago now. Maybe four years ago, and, and anyway, I did a gathering, and I had nothing to do with it. I didn't put it on or anything. I was performing at it. And I was hosting the stage. Okay. And, and I, yeah, I hosted the stage, and uh, it was just like walking around, and again, it was just overwhelming, like love, like just being at that event. There's something, there's something magical about the gatherings that just, uh, they just kind of spool you. It's almost like they change uh, the way you even perceive life. You know what I mean? It's like, like juggalos are, I've always said this, they're the, they're the coolest people on the fucking planet. You know what I mean? And when you're just there with that many of them all in one place, it's just you're schooled with freshness. You know what I mean? It just like, it just like moves you, like spiritually, emotionally, you just it just moves you, you know? So it's like, you know, hosting that stage and, you know what I mean? And, and, and you know, one of the things that was the hardest was, um, I had to announce, like, DMX and uh, didn't show up. And um, it was DMX and uh, the game. Right. Mm -hmm. Back to back, they didn't fucking show up. <laughs> I mean, the guys, and I'm, uh, you know, I don't know why, but I just suspect they were kind of scared. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they, they, maybe they heard some things on the side of the last minute they weren't coming. But I had to go out on stage and announce that they weren't coming back to back. And it was one of the hardest things I had to do, but it was like, it was like there was like no hate. I mean, I, I know people were upset, but they didn't, they didn't target me. You know what I mean? Well, it was like they, I was just, they realized it wasn't your yeah. fault either. I mean, it was, you know, they, they, they're yeah. the ones that backed out, not you. Right. So, but you know what I mean? Like that's such a showing of respect right there. It was like, it was like for me to have to go out there, like if I would have been, if I would have just been anybody, I would have probably been pelted 
<laughs> like, <laughs> I would have been stoned to death or something. If it would have been some some guy up there, they didn't they didn't know anything about. But it was like I don't know. It was the way I was able to come out there and then talk to the crowd and just tell them what was going on, and it was just like this massive show of respect. You know what I mean? And it was like again that just moved me a lot. Like I was like. I, was, I, I just couldn't believe it, you know. So it was a really positive experience at both of those gatherings. So then the idea started to come to me again, like, okay, you know, like, and, you know, I sat down with my brother and I had a long talk with him, and he, the whole time he had been trying to get me to come back, you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, I had a talk with him, and I said, look, man, this is what I'm thinking about doing. I'm thinking about coming back, you know. And, um you know, I had to talk to my wife and everything because I was like, you know what this is. You know, if I go back, you know you know how it was before because, and I've said this before in interviews, but, you know, with, like, Hobson, you know, he says, like, he threw his life away to get his foot up in this in bitch or something like that. It's like a lie. He's like, and that's fucking true, man. Like, you have to sacrifice so much to be in the entertainment business. And to be doing what we do every day, you have to throw your life away. And believe me, it's sacrifice. You know what I mean? Like the, all of the long hours being on the road and just working on projects and like putting everything into it because you don't want to see it fail. And when you're running your own business, you don't want to see that fail. Like, you know what I mean? You, you got you to gotta make sure that it succeeds. So it's not like just a normal job where if you're working at McDonald's or something, you don't really give a fuck, you know? Like you, you can give a fuck. Like you can, you can, you know, you can put your effort into your job, but you don't really give a fuck about that job. Like, when you leave that job, you're not thinking about that job. You're like, that's the last thing you want to think about. You know what I mean? Uh, but when, you, when you're when you running your own business, you know, it's very personal. Like, everything is very personal. You never want to see it fail. So you're, like, constantly struggling and busting ass and doing whatever's possible to, to keep the whole thing running and, and to keep everything dope, you know? So it, it, it requires a great deal of sacrifice. You know what I mean? Like, you know, time away from your family and loved ones and just the, the stress of it all. You know what I mean? Like, putting out albums and doing shows and doing gatherings and everything. You know, it's just an incredible amount of work, you know. So it's like, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I basically had to talk to my family and they, they backed me on it. And uh, it was where my heart was. Like, I had regained my heart, you know. And all the people I had trouble with were gone. We weren't working at the company anymore. So, like, Alex and a few others that I had, like, really big problems with, they were all gone, you know. So now, the psychopathic that we have now, like I was saying, it's like a, a close-knit group of, of homies, you know. We got some we got some super fresh juggalos working up here that are fucking schooling it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all juggalos, but you know what I mean? Like, like they actually submitted resumes and shit. <laughs> like uh-huh. looking at it, and we we're like, "Oh man, he's got this fucking guy with a super fresh skill set." <laughs> you know what I mean? And so then, you know, brought him in for interviews, and and you know, it was just like, you know, I just I just really love where psychopathic is right now. Like, you know what I mean? And um, I just feel really positive. Like, I just feel like everything is is is, is on the rise. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, and and, and we're not trying to get to the, you know. We want to sell millions of albums. We don't really give a fuck about that. Like, we just want to get to that place where it's like, we got our fucking family and we're able to keep doing what we do for our family. You know what I mean? Like, we're at a nice spot where, you know what I mean? We can, we can come in and do a gathering. You know what I mean? Put that bitch on, you know, even though the expenses are ridiculous. Like, we, we have those resources to do all that, you know, and it's like, to provide that flavor, it's like it's like the motivation for everything that we do. You know, it's definitely the motivation for everything that I do. You know what I mean? Like everything that I consider, it's always like, you know, like like how can I make this super fresh for the for the juggalos? You know, for our family. Like how can I make this super fresh for us? Mm-hmm. Man, what yeah. the, what an incredible what an incredible story! I'm, I appreciate you sharing that with us. That's it just shows that your your love and dedication to the the whole juggle nation. So. Uh, on behalf of everybody, I can say we definitely appreciate it. Oh, no, no, thank you, man. You know, and, uh, it's definitely a bit windy. <laughs> a bit <laughs> no, no, work. no, man. It, it, I, was, <laughs> I was intrigued the entire time. I'm sure everybody listening will be, too. Yeah. Man, I don't think there's a really a, a, a better spot to end this, so, so let me let you have your final word about the gathering and, and anything else that you might want to say. All right, look, man. The only thing I got to say is, like, 
I, I just I, I just really I really 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 love the gathering this year. I think it's uh, as far as the gathering goes. I, I think it's just everything is super on point. Everything has come together. I really feel that we're ahead of the game. You know what I mean? Like last year, it was like everything was kind of fucked up and like behind. But this year, I feel like because of the amount of work that everybody's putting in. We're really trying hard to make sure that everything's super on point and that everybody has a super good time, you know. And uh, so, I, I just feel like uh, if you're gonna, if you've never been to a gathering, this is definitely the one to go to. <laughs> this is the one because it's, it's got a super good buzz, and there's just been nothing but love, and uh, and I, I, I'm super looking forward to it. Yeah, as am I, man. It's the 15th year. It's gonna be absolutely magical. Brand new spot killer lineup i know that everybody's just incredibly hype about it so you know much and i, and I wanted to end with the bruce lee quote I'm, okay. I'm reading this i actually brought it up here uh if you always put a limit on everything you do it will spread into your work and into your life there are no limits there are only plateaus and you must not stay there you must go beyond them <laughs> you know I mean? Excellent. And, and yeah what that's saying is like you know don't ever limit, you know, there, there are no limits. Like, like I look at like the juggalo world, uh, the juggalo, like there, there are no limits to what we can do. You know what I mean? Like people look at us and like, Oh, what the fuck? You know, you're fighting the FBI. There's fucking no way you can win that. You know what I mean? Or, or you, you're doing a, you're doing a gathering. There's fucking no way you can do that. Or there's no way you can do that again. Like, you know, like people last year, they were looking at it, the gathering and it, it was like, I don't know why, but maybe because it was kind of fucked up. But they were like, oh, it's the last gathering, and I kept hearing that. And it's like, no, fuck that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this will never end. Like, this is like, you know what I mean? There, there's that plateau, and we keep going. We keep we keep striving to get to that next level. You know what I mean? You, you never want to be stagnant, you know? And that's kind of like where we're at right now, uh, where we're at at Psychopathic and, and where the juggles are at, I feel. There's no limit to what we can do, you know what I mean? Especially if we stick together and keep moving ahead together, it's like it's a super beautiful thing. You know what I mean? It's something that I'm very proud and happy to be a part of, and I'm very proud that that uh, life has afforded me this opportunity to be able to provide for our family like we do. You know what I mean? Like like all we do is set up the foundation. You know what I mean? At one time, at one time, juggalos, like at the very inception of the juggalos, it was just like they were kind of like fans of ICP, you know, before it really evolved into what it is, you know what I mean? Like, I'm talking at the very, very beginning of it, and then it evolved into a family, and it evolved into something that's much bigger than us, you know what I mean? It's much bigger than ICP or psychopathic, it's something that that is just, uh, it's amazing to behold, and it's amazing to be a small part of it, you know, because all we do... All we do up here at Psychopathic is provide entertainment for our family. That's one part of what we do. Just like you got you guys that provide the news for the family. And we got the SCU that provides clothing and food for the family in need. You know what I mean? Like we're all doing something for the family. Like we're all contributing to this greater whole of what we are. You know, and it's just it's just amazing to be a part of it. It's amazing to be a part of this family. And, and it's an honor to keep to keep uh, putting in work for y'all and for us, you know. Man, Jump Steady, I got to I gotta thank you for your time. I know it's been an extremely long interview, but I, I think people are going to really dig it. I think that's all That's all we got to cover. So um, for FagoLovers.net, this is Scotty D and uh, Jump Steady, and we're out.